We're going to hold up just a couple minutes. There's people, a group of people coming in from the parking lot. We'll give them a grace period here for a couple minutes. <laughs> And remember, after the program, if you haven't seen the historic objects in the back of the room, you've got time to visit those. Those are objects that we do not have on display currently, um, and they're part of our very large collection of objects here at the Harding Sites. Okay, we're going to get started here. Welcome to Death of a President, the Truths and Myths about President Harding's Last Days. My name is Sherry Hall, Site Manager of the Warren G. Harding Presidential Sites in Marion, Ohio. The Harding Sites are comprised of the new Warren G. Harding Library and Museum, 
where we are situated right now, the recently restored Harding Home and the Harding Memorial Presidential Gravesite. Our sites are part of the Ohio History Connection system of sites throughout our state. We want to welcome not only our on-site audience here, but we have folks through our YouTube channel watching from all over the country. I'd like to introduce our panelists. John Anderson, right next to me, longtime researcher for the Harding Sites, does a lot of our public programming. He is a graduate of Baldwin Wallace University. When he's not researching the times and lives of President Mrs. Harding, he is a professional chef. Why not? <laughs> Dr. Richard Harding up on our screen, who's zooming in from South Carolina, is a grandnephew of President Harding. So his grandfather, Dr. George T. Harding Jr., was the president's brother. Dr. Harding, a fourth generation physician, is one of 28 family members who became physicians. Before his retirement, he was the neuropsychiatry and behavioral science department chair at the University of South Carolina Medical School. Among his many leadership roles, he is also a former president of the American Psychiatric Association. Now today is the 100th anniversary of the death of President Warren G. Harding. He was just 57 years old when he died. He died in the presidential suite of the Palace Hotel in San Francisco at 7.30 p.m. Pacific Standard Time, which is 10.30 p.m. our time here in Marion. President Harding was in the midst of a very long trip across the country, visiting the Western states, Canada, and Alaska when he died. John, can you give us some context about that trip? Certainly. Uh, I think where I like to try to explain the Western trip, there's a lot of misconceptions of what this trip really was. Really, it's an ambitious hope to travel and investigate the West by President Harding. Uh, he referred to it as the voyage of understanding uh, to try to act as his uh, nature as a professional newspaper man, as a reporter, trying to be firsthand knowledge and experience, get to know the people, get to know the facts and be able to assess information accordingly and be able to present all the sides of the story. Warren claimed that, and I quote, he was trying to learn more about the United States of America and seeking to have the people of the United States to know more about their government. It was a chance for understanding for both the president and the people to understand and know each other better. This trip is often viewed as a re-election journey, especially because looking at it in modern times, when you have a president, sitting president up for re-election, potentially traveling around the country, such as where we're going through right now, you don't picture candidates going to Iowa and all that right now just to get to know people. There's a purpose behind it. That's kind of where the political nature has moved to today. But this trip was something that was planned well before the actual journey itself in 1923. It was supposed to take place originally in the, in, uh, the late summer, early fall of 1922. But because of in, increased failing health of Florence Harding, the first lady of the United States, uh, the trip would, had to be postponed. There's always, this was really pushed for by many people that this trip needed to happen for various reasons. The, Republican Party at the time had hoped that during the midterm elections that a president going around even for the purpose of his own understanding might help bolster midterm elections as well. So there was a driving force that this trip should happen sooner. And Warren and Florence had hoped to take this trip sooner as well, but thanks to uh, Florence's ailing health, it just was not meant to be. <clears throat> the, what were the goals of this trip? This was supposed to be a 67 day trip beginning June 20th, 1923, and finishing around August 27th. They would travel along west along railroad lines and boat up to Alaska. He would return down, they would return down the west coast and take a boat to the Panama Canal and return to Washington, D.C. There were three overall goals to this trip. One was to let the people see the government up close and personal. 
Today, we take for granted the fact that you turn on a TV and you can see any political official, hear anyone's voice, and know anything about them. In this time, in rural uh, breadbasket America, these are people that would very rarely see their local officials or know who they were, let alone actually see and hear a president. There's also the reverse. As president, he is receiving a lot of information and a lot of questions on his opinion on how do we approach various topics for the rest of the country. Uh, during this time, we are coming out of an economic recession, trying to work our way through that. The farmers need help. The coal workers and train workers need help. Warren wants to know who these people are and what better way to really understand what's going on than going out there and physically seeing it. Get to see what's going on in the local communities, talk to people, really get that firsthand knowledge. There's also this question about Alaska. With the territory of Alaska, we're not quite sure what to do with it yet. At this time in 1923, there's five cabinet officials and 28 different government bureaus that had some form of authority over Alaska. And we, st we still couldn't figure out at that point, what do you do with it? And the, there was always this contrast of using resources or conserving resources. And at this point, it was tough to decide what to do. And President Harding's hearing all sorts of different opinions and ideas of direction. And uh, along with this trip, why not go up there and see himself and see what's going on there and really come up again as a, as a reporter? What's the facts? Let's present them and come up with a good consensus idea of what's best for everybody. So this trip supposed to be 1922, 1923 finally comes along. It's time for them to hit the road and see what's going on out there. Now, Florence Harding was thought to be in more precarious health than the president, and there were some who thought the trip to Alaska was too risky for her. Can you speak to that, John? I think now, with again hindsight, we associate this trip with obviously being President Harding must have been in poor health. Everyone knew that because he died during the trip. So, of course, everyone's focused on that. And it's the complete opposite that really there's, there's a lot more going on with Florence Harding, the first lady. For those of you that may not be familiar, she is going to go through a lifelong battle with nephritis, also known as floating kidney. Uh, if you're not familiar with that, essentially your kidney drops a little into the pelvic region, predominantly when you're standing vertically. So you feel the organ drops down it causes inflammation of tissue surrounding the, the kidney. There's retention of fluid, inability to filter proteins properly. It's very painful. You can have blockages. Essentially, um, there, there's, there's times when Florence is gonna be bedridden for months and months at a time, unable to function. When she has one of these blockages and her body can't filter anything properly and the fluid retention, she is basically near death at any given moment when this is happening. And what makes it even trickier is this poor health leaves her in a really tightrope scenario. Do you operate on her? Do you go in there and try to remove a kidney? If you operate on her because of her poor condition, it could kill her. If you don't operate on her because of her ailment, it could kill her. What direction do you go? And this is something that's going to be a lifelong battle and fear of what do you do? And at one point, it was reaching the brink of a surgery and she happened to pass the blockage and kind of recover a little bit. There's always this little teetering moment with her. So... She lives her life on essentially on half capacity of her kidneys at best. And she is extremely fragile health-wise. Now, she does not let that slow her down by any means. I, I mean, you see these, you really think about, I, I, tried to, well, I tried to think about this last night of having that kind of discomfort. And I recently returned from a trip with a bunch of annoying airlines and issues like that. It's very different from a railroad trip or a boat and thought about my natural discomfort, feeling of decent health. And then you combine that with her, 
of all of her issues and slap her onto a train in the 1920s, going all the way across the West, going up through Alaska on a boat on the choppy waters and going through. This is a very dangerous trip for her health-wise. She is going to have flare-ups along the trip. She's going to be better in at times aboard the USS Henderson, the boat that's going to take them up through up to Alaska. All the medical eyes were trained and focused on her, not Warren, during this trip. Warren may be not doing well, but everyone's so much more concerned about Florence. In fact, Dr. Boone, the presidential physician on the trip, uh, recommended, and they, they did, bring a casket with them on the boat of the USS Henderson as they were going up to Alaska, just in case Florence had taken a southward turn. They didn't mention that to her. Uh, that tends to be a frowned upon carry-on, in case you're curious. But that's where the notion is. They, they really are, if there's anyone they're really worried about on this trip, it's Florence. And based off of her history, uh, rightfully so. So at this point, let's talk about the president. In January of 23, he comes down with an illness that's diagnosed first as a bad cold, then as the flu. Richard, can you explain what was going on with the president at this time? Sure, and I'm very pleased to be here with you uh, this evening. Um, president uh, Harding was born in 1865. And if you were born in 1865, you, you had a life expectancy of 48 years. If you made it to your 10th birthday, you had a life expectancy of 58 years. So things were tough back then, and it wasn't an easy time uh, to uh, uh, live and to be well. In the early decade, the first decade of the 20th century, 1908 or so, President Harding began having his blood pressure taken by his younger brother, my grandfather, George, who was a physician in Columbus. He was surprised to find that his healthy, vigorous brother had blood pressure around 160 to 180 each time that he took that. Now, most of us now know what our blood pressure was, but back then, nobody really paid much attention to it. But they knew that that was a bit high, but they didn't know what the consequences were, and there was no treatment. So I'm bringing this up because since about 1905, up until 1923, President Harding looked vigorous, athletic, good looking, all the things that uh, made him a great candidate, but all of this hypertension was going on, destroying or critically injuring his uh, vascular system in his heart and other places. So in 1923, he began having some symptoms. And the symptoms that he first showed were the, were the ones of orthopnea. Now, orthopnea is a problem where your heart isn't pounding and pumping enough. And so if you lie flat in bed, the blood begins to pool in your lungs and you can't sleep at night because you can't get to sleep because you start getting short of breath if you're lying flat. So he had to start sleeping, sitting up in bed in that, during that time. He had fevers and they weren't sure what the fevers were coming from. They were upper quadrant fevers or pains and it was probably due to some kind of gallbladder issue. And um, he just didn't feel good. He, he uh, had the, the temperatures, he had the shortness of breath, and most significantly, and what we would recognize today immediately, is that he had crushing chest pain with pain going down his left arm. All of those things, resulted in his doctors feeling that he should rest more, uh, which was true, 
but they had no treatments for him other than rest. And so at that time, he was put to bed, uh, his uh, various appointments were canceled, and for two, two weeks, he uh, recovered. And the newspaper called it the grip influenza because that the closest thing they could think of, somebody short of breath and all, was the influenza of 1918, the Spanish flu. Uh, but uh, that wasn't what was going on in 1923. That had pretty much passed. But uh, he did have similar symptoms, and he had to take it easy and then uh, follow the doctor's advice and did the best he could with it. But it started 20 years prior to that. So it seems, John, that it took a long time for the president to regain his strength from whatever that was going on in January. They decided to go to Florida, not unusual for them. They had been vacationing in Florida in March for many, many years. Um, tell us about that trip and if it did actually help him in his recuperation. Well, around the final week of March, Warren Florence take a trip down to Miami, and there's a photo of them at the Cocolobo Club. I love that name. And fun fact, if you type into Google search on my laptop, it stays permanently in there, and anytime you type something with a C, it tells you you want to look for Cocolobo. <laughs> but the thought was, just as Dr. Harding pointed out, uh, this idea that a lot of this is dealt around overexertion and the need to rest and recover. And two of the largest medical influences in the Hardings' lives at this point is through uh, personal physician and close friend, Dr. Charles Sawyer, a homeopath, as well as uh, Dr. Harding's grandfather, the brother, Dr. George Harding Jr., both of which are endorsing that notion of rest and recovery as well as good general health practices. Uh, we have uh, letters, which I, I love to think of how they're going through it, of, of Warren's brother sending him ideas of what he should be eating daily to provide for better health practices. And when you read through them, they're not the most stimulating venues. And I like to think of Warren looking at it saying, I'm allowed a glass of warm milk and a green vegetable. Thanks. I'll have a cigar and I'll enjoy my strawberry shortcake. But the notion is that better health, relaxation, and stepping away from those stresses, especially with blood pressure and chest ailments, will help allow the body a chance to step back and recuperate. So this trip was meant to be that opportunity to step away, especially following Warren's health issues kind of being exasperated during the beginning of 1923. Now at this time, Florence, also ups and downs with her health still, is spending most of the time on a houseboat out and off the coast, very rarely coming ashore. Florida Warren is kind of doing his typical relaxation things of fishing. And you can see him with his group there and all their fish at the Coco Lobo. But it really, although helped a little bit, the ailments didn't go away. They kind of lessened a little bit. But again, much like Dr. Harding said, they weren't sure exactly how to approach these sorts of things. So I rested, I felt a little bit better, let's get back to work, because this is life. It wasn't something that you took that next serious concern level about. So they're ready to return back to Washington following their rest, but feeling a little bit better than when they left. So I'll just keep going. Okay, so at this point, we are noticing that others around the Hardings, uh, especially around Warren, are noticing He's, he's not acting the same. He's not physically presenting the same. These are two, I, I have three stories, uh, all of which are taking place weeks before the Hardings leave for their Western trip. Up top, you have Senator Frank Willis of Ohio. He's the gentleman that, former governor of Ohio, and took Warren's Senate seat when he assumed the presidency. 
Frank Willis tells a story that he was going to try to meet up with the president just weeks before the Western trip with a list of five discussion points in his hand, had it all listed out. I'm going to take care of all five of these things while I have my time with the president. When he returned from the meeting, he was only able to check two items off the agenda. And Willis's personal secretary had asked what, what happened, where to go, to which Willis said, uh, just kind of brushed it off, said just, and I quote, Warren seems so tired. He just can't even sit through longer meetings and discussions. He's just so physically drawn back from his ailments. Uh, Secretary of State Charles Evans Hughes uh, was a became a closer confidant of Warren Harding and a golfing buddy as well. Warren and him had a chance to speak, and Warren mentioned to him that his heart rate is consistently above 175. Um, so for those of you that are like me that have no medical idea whatsoever and you hear a big number going, yeah, I don't know what that means yet because I'm only in my, mid, my late 30s, so I don't worry about my health that crazily yet. Uh, you should be about 68 to 76 beats per minute, not 175. And Warren's acting very blasé about it. That's just, just where I am. That's my natural cadence. Uh, Secretary Hughes tells his wife upon learning this that we have been worrying about Mrs. Harding, but I think it is the president we should have been worrying about. And then my favorite, speaking exactly to Warren, is golfing buddy Colonel Edmund Starling. Warren would go golfing with him out there, and Warren started complaining and said, Colonel, why after playing 11 or 12 holes do I drag my feet and feel so tired? Colonel Stall Stalling, Starling suggested that, well, why don't you just play nine holes? <laughs> Warren's response, hell, if I can't play 18 holes, I won't play at all. But this is where Warren's standing. People are noticing that vigor, that icon of you know, presidential, I don't want to say presidential perfection, but he is the complete package. This is what we're looking for, as Dr. Harding explained, where we're finding those issues at the rising daily. So we know that the trip to Florida helped a little bit maybe to restore the president's energy, but really what was his health situation when he and Florence stepped out of the White House to start the Western trip on June 20th? Richard, can you describe the symptoms he was already experiencing at this point? Uh, he was he was slightly better than in January, but he had a, a continuation of the same symptoms. He had chest pain. He had high blood pressure. He had vague indigestion, oftentimes following a meal. He still could not sleep flat. He had to prop himself up. And many of you probably have put bricks underneath the front uh, legs of your bed to kind of prop yourself up a little bit, but he needed to sit up to sleep at night. He also had insomnia, but the real critical issue was extreme exhaustion. When, when you have extreme exhaustion that comes out of nowhere, or you haven't had that build up gradually because of not exercising, that generally points to heart and liver, one of those two things. And so something was going on and he was mad because he couldn't finish 18 holes and uh, he enjoyed that uh, very much. That was the only real relaxation that he had in Washington at the time. And so he uh, was, was very frustrated uh, by that. But all of those things were still present, but he was a politician and he was strong and he looked uh, on the, the day that they were leaving like he was headed for the uh, uh, vacation and gonna have a good time. But uh, in reality, everybody was looking at Florence, but he was the one who really had the problems starting out. So this begs the question, John. He's already ill with something before the trip begins. Why didn't somebody call it off? Well, it's uh, this is going to sound kind of crazy, 
especially after the fact, but there was a legitimate belief that this trip was going to be restful to a certain degree for, for the Hardings. Um, this was a trip that was arranged by Republican leader and future Postmaster General Walter Brown with overall a very light itinerary. There's a lot more traveling, some sightseeing, but the intent was like actual public interactions and speeches were going to be limited as they went. The, then also, this is not like an uncommon practice as much as I think we still look at, I, I try not to look at it in a modern take where it's odd to think of a president, I'm going to take the next couple months off, guys. I'll see you around the country. Um, back then, during a time where that humid and hot summer in Washington, D.C., with no air conditioning, presidents traveled away to cooler climate during this time of the year. So this is not abnormal. So standard practice, this is going to be an overall restful vacation other than the traveling strains, but really this is a chance to recharge, get your information and kind of, you know, get your bearings back again. Now, one of the biggest problems we run into this with is Warren. Warren is the biggest issue to this. He wants to make frequent stops along the way. He wants to meet anybody and everybody that's coming up to train tracks. He wants to speak and see the people, just as his goal of the voyage of understanding would be. Now, for a man that's supposed to be taking a restful, a restful trip, stopping every other state, every state to see every farmer and every everybody that's coming nearby, you're going to start wearing yourself down heavily. And this is just adding undue strain to a trip that they weren't expecting. So Richard, I'd like to give you free reign to start us on the trip from a medical perspective. We know that the president's schedule kept ballooning as he traveled west. More speeches, more parades, more dinners. How did this affect his health? Well, as you can see in these pictures, um, he, he kept saying, how do you turn these people down? And he will want to admit that he was a people person and loved to press the flesh and would stop uh, for a hundred people along the railroad and as John was talking about. So a few talks became over a hundred talks uh, during the, the uh, uh, time of the trip. And he also though had to uh, make a number of political stops. For instance, in Utah, he stopped with uh, Senator Moot who was uh, one of his good friends in the Senate and a real ally. And uh, we've been all over Utah with him, including Zion National Park, which had just become a national park. Rode horses for hours uh, up the canyons of Zion, uh, feeling not well and exhausted the whole time. But he did it uh, to, to uh, meet his obligations as well as to meet people from all over the country. He started getting extraordinarily tired. He was already near exhaustion, but um, started complaining. And on the 4th of July, he was in Tacoma and he uh, walked up to his assistant, uh, Mr. Christian, and said, you've got to modify my schedule. This is going to kill me. And um, fortunately, that was the last stop before they got on board the Henderson and started up the coast to Alaska. During that time, the pace of the um, uh, days slackened some, and he was able to rest more, although he continued to be exhausted, as shown here in a couple of um, really unusual things that he did. When he was up in Nanana, which is way up uh, near Fairbanks uh, in Alaska, they, they were finishing the Alaskan Railroad. And he was asked to drive the Golden Spike to finish the railroad. And he said that um, his hands were stiff. He could hardly hang on to the hammer. 
That's because he was in failure and the fluid had started backing up in his ankles and his hands. And when he went to hit the hit at the golden spike, he said he almost blacked out and he almost, the hammer almost flew out of his hands. But he finished and did it and with a great applause. And I'm hoping someday we'll find that uh, golden spike. We're not sure exactly where it is, although I know people are trying to hunt it down. But, but uh, the other picture shows him climbing up hundreds of steps where he went and looked at a coal mine in a small town in Alaska. And again, he was able to do that, and he shouldn't have. He probably would have died right there had... Um, <coughs> you know, it'd been the, the, the time, but it wasn't, and he made it through that. Uh, but uh, climbing stairs like that when he was in uh, heart failure, as he was, was just uh, unbelievable uh, task for him to complete. But he did his duty as president and um, made all of those kinds of appearances. Now, during that same time, Florence became more ill with her nephritis, with her kidney condition. And the attention turned from him to her, which was the usual thing. But if he, he kind of lied, he didn't want to be the center of attention in a negative kind of way. So having uh, Florence be the sick one was uh, more comfortable for him. And he was able to rest and so forth. When I was when I was up in Alaska, uh, I would go into little towns driving around with my wife and, and niece, and, and um, almost every town had a little saloon where they said that on July the 22nd or something, uh, Warren G. Harding came in here and spent the whole night drinking and and having and partying and having the biggest time, and uh, he was right here at this uh, place. Well, <laughs> that's very unlikely. Uh, he was able to even sit up during that time at night. He had to sit up to sleep, but every place had one of the one of the, those uh, plaques on the walls. It was uh, it was kind of humorous and kind of sad too. But that's the, that was the way Alaska went. He loved Alaska. He, he felt like this was something special, and he wanted to preserve it. And he wanted to work extra hard to do some things like preserve the fishing for the native uh, Alaskans and to um, make it a, a well-run, disciplined kind of place that would someday become a state. And he predicted that, that it would become a state uh, sometime. It took about 40 years for that to happen, but it did. So with that, uh, he closed the time after three weeks in uh, Alaska, feeling okay, feeling about as exhausted as when he came, but able to function, able to give some talks, talking to the locals and pictures of him, talking to Native Americans and so forth. But then they got back on the Henderson and started back down the coast to go to Sitka and then to Vancouver, Seattle, and then England. But then things changed. And would you like me to go further at yes. that point? Yep, that's fine. That's fine. Okay. He got, while he was coming down, um, the first night on the ship, <clears throat> he had an attack of abdominal pain and fever that was severe. And uh, he, he retreated to his room, lay there, exhausted, feeling terrible. This was after dinner on the first night on the, the, on the Henderson. Now, Somebody asked, as you see there, that's Dr. Sawyer um, with his uh, general outfit on. Somebody asked him the following day why the president was not feeling so well. And he came up with the idea 
that the president must have had some tainted crab meat. If there was crab meat served the night before, then he must have had some tainted crab. Now, why he said that, I can only imagine, and we'll get a little bit more to, to uh, the general, he was a homeopathic physician, and homeopaths like to choose the simplest answer to a problem. They don't like to get into complicated situations. They like to say, well, he had a stomachache because of some crab, instead of the possibility of all kinds of things, including uh, uh, gallbladder stones or an ulcer or other things that would have required a great deal more care on the part of the physicians. So he offered that as one of the, the uh, answers, and that was, of course, grabbed by the press. That was kind of neat. Um, you know, crab meat, tainted crab meat, and that became one of the reasons that the president was ill during the last part of his uh, illness. He got to Vancouver, and uh, they had a whole day packed for him where he ended it up it, he didn't end it, but it ended the afternoon where he was to play golf. And he felt like he could hardly walk. And his hands were stiff, his ankles were swollen, and he got up on the first tee, and he was, you can see in the picture there, he was surrounded by uh, people from Vancouver, Canadians, seeing their first American president, the first one who'd ever come to Canada, by the way. And he got up there and, and thought to himself, please don't let me miss, and please don't let me let this club fly from my hands, because he can hardly hold on to it, and go into the crowd and hurt somebody. But he got up there, and he hit, and, made, and hit it about 100 yards down the fairway, and was greatly relieved, and began walking along the fairway. After a couple holes, he told his staff that he could not go further. He was exhausted. They had him walk across to the 18th green or 18th fairway and finish up the last hole instead of playing the whole course. He went back, gave two talks that night, went back to the boat and collapsed. The next day, they arrived in Seattle. And in Seattle, he had the same kind of activities. Uh, he gave talks in the uh, um, Husky Stadium. He gave talks to uh, groups. And again, um, he predicted during that time that uh, Alaska would be a state someday. What a wonderful place it was. He got back on the boat. Or he, they, they were going to leave on the train and go to Yosemite eventually inland and then come to San Francisco. But, and on the, the uh, train, uh, Dr. Boone, one of the other doctors, examined him and found that he had an enlarged heart and his blood pressure was normal. That is, it was way lower than it normally was, which again was a sign of failure, heart failure. His, his heart was giving out with its high level of pumping that it had been doing for 20 years, and now it couldn't handle the volume. It's like a balloon that expands and becomes flaccid. It was hard for the heart to contract because it was failing. And with that, every, he, he talked to Dr. Uh, Sawyer, and they became very concerned, and they uh, called head to San Francisco, talked to the head of Stanford, who was a physician, who we'll talk about in just a minute, and said, we need the best cardiologist that you have to meet us when we arrive, and we'll come directly there instead of going to Yosemite. And so they set out on the train to go directly uh, to San Francisco instead of going to Yosemite first and seeing that national park. Maybe we could have the next slide. This is, this is the last picture taken of Warren G. Harding. 
um, on a Sunday morning in San Francisco. The doctors wanted to take him to the freight yard and take him off the train in a stretcher. But he said, there's no way that I am going to, as president of the United States, be taken off this train in a stretcher. So they went to the normal place. He got dressed and uh, met the mayor of San Francisco and then was taken directly to the Palace Hotel, which you see there in the picture, which was a new hotel and the finest hotel on the West Coast at that time. Remember, this is only about 15 years after the San Francisco earthquake and fire. New hotel. He walked into the building, walked to the elevator, got off, walked into his suite, collapsed on the bed, exhausted. But he made it to that. And he was very proud, kind of, that he had not let himself look like an invalid to the people there in uh, San Francisco. But everybody was extraordinarily concerned about him. With the uh, variable in San Francisco, there were five doctors who helped take care of him. The five doctors, if you look there on the left, was Dr. Sawyer, who was from Marion, Ohio, a homeopathic physician, about the same age as uh, the president, a little bit older, actually, uh, and uh, a uh, homeopath and uh, president of the Ohio Homeopathic Association, a distinguished uh, homeopath physician. About at that time, homeopathy was about 20 to 30 percent of all physicians in Ohio. The next uh, person over here on the right is uh, Joel Boone. He was a homeopathic physician, graduating from Hahnemann in Philadelphia, and then going into the Navy in 1915 and taking additional work with the Navy Medical Corps. So that he had more of the <clears throat> allopathic that is the regular MD training and went into World War I as a physician for the Marines. He was a Navy doctor. He got the Congressional Medal of Honor for his bravery on the front in uh, France and uh, was, was quite a war hero. Five silver stars and so forth. And <clears throat> because of that was assigned to White House duty following the war as a young uh, physician. On the left is uh, Dr. Ray Wilbur, who was president of Stanford University and a physician who had been the dean of Stanford Medical School. Young man, young boy wonder, and had become the president of the university to be about 15 years after graduating from the university. Next below him was Dr. Work, who was Secretary of the Interior, a physician from the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, again, a, a physician maybe who wasn't practicing much, but doing more administration. The two new physicians that were joining was Dr. Wilbur and Dr. Cooper. We don't have a picture of Dr. Cooper, but he was a graduate of the University of Scotland. He was a distinguished cardiologist, and Dr. Wilbur felt he was the best cardiologist in San Francisco at the time. So he came to, and those, those five doctors, along with two Navy nurses, Ms. Dowser and Ms. Powderly, <clears throat> were the people who were taking care of the president. Uh, and um, they proceeded to uh, evaluate as well as um, uh, treat the president during the next six days that he was there. Would you like me to go on, Sherry, or is there, is there other things? No, this is good. Th these are some examples of several types of medical records that are in the Harding presidential papers. Uh, Dr. Harding had access to them to study um, and this will become especially important as he was interpreting for us really what the medical jargon meant on these charts to really 
better explain what the president was going through these last couple of days of his life. Um, Richard, what else did you do to uh, check your sources and, and figure this out? Well, the people who were there and who wrote things up were Dr. Wilbur and um, Dr. Boone. The rest didn't write much, but the, uh, there at the, at the Harding uh, Presidential site, there is a just a wonderful collection of things like nurses' notes and uh, the um, the orders that the nurses uh, took and what they said and when they gave medicines. Um, very detailed um, explanations of what the treatment was and what the problems were. You, you can't quite see it well, but you see the clinical chart on the left side, and it says the president. And then it goes from July the 30th to the 2nd of August. So that was the time he was there. And the top line is, the, is his temperature. He had 102 temperature, but the temperature gradually came down. And his respirations were extraordinarily fast. They were, they were you know, you... Our respirations are 15 to 20 a minute. His were 60, 70 sometimes. And if you think about that, that's some handy. That's just going in <laughs> like that. And that's how he was during the first several days. Although that slowed down, he never got close to normal. But with all of these kinds of things, we were able to piece together some of the, and in addition, uh, a very talented surgeon from Duke University named Dr. Pappas, Theodore Pappas, who is a professor of surgery, wrote an article in 2020 in the Annals of Surgery that went through all of these things and as a modern physician, 100 years later, discussed what they meant and what probably was going on that the doctors in 1923 had no idea what was going on. Because let me just give you a couple examples. In 1920, there was no such thing as antibiotics. In 1920, that was going to be 20 years later. And there were no things to help high blood pressure. Diuretics were in 1950 or so, diarrheal. And then to have other um, antihypertensives, you'd have to wait till the 60s and 70s. If you wanted to do an x-ray, which they did do an x-ray, which is a modern miracle in 1923, they were looking for what was going on in his lungs. And they saw some patches in his lungs. They felt that was probably pneumonia. Probably wasn't, but that was a good guess. That was, that was as good as they could have done. But they also were looking for gallstones. But gallstones are cholesterol. They, they don't show up on x-ray. So when they were looking, they didn't see that. And it would have, it'd be 1960 or 70 before ultrasound came in where you could really see those gallstones. So these gentlemen were, were working hard, but they didn't have um, the knowledge or the tools to make uh, things happen. Now, some, some people would say, why didn't they go to a hospital instead of going to the Palace Hotel? Well, presidents didn't go to hospitals. There had never been a president in a hospital up until 1952 because as almost every president who has had a medical problem, and there were a lot of them that had serious medical problems, Grover Cleveland, McKinley, um, uh, Harding, Roosevelt, you, you can go through the list. They felt that if they went, and it was recommended to Harding that by his sisters that he go in the hospital back in January, but he said, no, it would crash the markets if I do that. Grover Cleveland said the same thing. It will crash the markets if I go in a hospital. So no president ever went into the hospital 
until Truman and Eisenhower in the 1950s. The problem with that was that here um, you had five doctors, all of whom were prima donnas and very, uh, very good doctors in their own right, but all having no idea of the real severity or how to determine or how to treat those uh, severe problems that the president, they began realizing. They put out a daily bulletin uh, that was always signed by uh, Dr. Sawyer as the chief doctor. He, he remained that chief uh, throughout, but they were, they were just kind of little blurbs and uh, not uh, um, real accurate as far as what was truly going on with his uh, heart, gallbladder, and his uh, exhaustion that he was going through. Um, so at this point, Richard, we're going to dissect August 2nd, because that's, of course, that's the day on which he died. Um, this was a day that started out much differently than the day before, in, in a good way. Uh, the president was feeling a little bit better. Everybody's feeling a little bit more optimistic. So can you take us through August 2nd? August 2nd uh, turned out to be a very good day for the first half. Uh, he was feeling better. He was breathing easier. His temperature had come down somewhat. Um, he was able to take a little more than just milk. Uh, he took some eggnog and toast. All uh, this is recorded in the nurse's notes. Uh, and he was uh, feeling better. And um, his sister, Charity, came and visited. And she walked in, and she was kind of a tough old bird. And she said, Warren, you got to take better care of yourself. And he said, oh, Chad, it, it was, it's, it's worse than that. My heart this time. Uh, and she got, she was, uh, instead of being angry at him, she got scared. But she uh, felt better that he was doing better. He said, you know, I thought yesterday I wasn't going to make it. But I turned the corner yesterday, and I think now I'm going to make it. So she was, she was pleased with that. And as the day went on, they, uh, the doctors were relieved. They saw him at 4 o'clock, their, their daily rounds. Uh, and they felt that things were improving. So many of them exited, a couple of them stayed around uh, and were um, getting things ready for the evening. Um, Florence, uh, you know, found an article about the president uh, in a, a newspaper. And, and it was a positive article and he, she was reading it to him. And he, he said, uh, you know, that's, that's good. And, and all of a sudden, he became very um, kind of looking off in the distance and then immediately soaked himself with sweat and then came around again and kind of looked around and said, you know, I, that's, I, I had a strange feeling. I never have felt that before, um, but I feel okay now. And uh, the, the nurse uh, saw that he had, had had the sweat and he had soaked his pajamas, changed his pajamas. He felt good. And um, he, he, he said after, after getting re, kind of reset there on the, on the sofa that he was on, he turned to his wife, uh, who was there with the two nurses and probably Dr. Sawyer standing in the hallway uh, from reading the different uh, um, ways of looking at it from, from different uh, standpoints and different people who wrote about the last few minutes. And then, um, according to who you read, he just was sitting there going, go on, uh, that's good. And then he slumped and he was, and he had no breath and he was completely relaxed. Florence called for the doctor to come in, who came in, and according to which person you read, uh, Dr. Sawyer went over 
and touched him and said, he's gone. Dr. Boone said that he came in and came in and touched his corneas, which was the way he kind of told somebody was dead or not in those days, and said uh, that he is, he's gone, there's nothing we can do. Um, of course, Aunt Florence uh, became quite uh, hysterical. Do something, can't you do something? And uh, they both um, told her that there was, there was nothing that they could do and that he was gone. So what happened? One of the things that we talk about was that this uh, kind of period just before where he stopped breathing and, and had the arrest. Um, when, you're at, when you have cardiac uh, uh, failure, one of the cardinal symptoms coming up to it is that your heart almost stops beating. You feel okay, but your heart almost stops beating and you have a massive surge of adrenaline, which causes a soaking of sweat throughout and that that seems to be what happened uh, when you read uh, uh, various people's looking at that from now as opposed to looking at it back then but he came around his heart was beating and then of course he got prepared again and then he slumped and was gone now he was gone in 1923 in 2023, if he had slumped, what would have happened? Well, somebody would have gotten a defibrillator, put it on his chest, and started his heart back up. But that was the, that was science fiction in 1923, and a lot of things were that today would have meant that he would have had a more full life with medicines, a stent for his coronary arteries, and things like uh, a defibrillator that now is in every hotel uh, area and uh, would have been used to his advantage instead of saying he's gone. Now, one of the real uh, issues is what did he die of? And maybe we can come to that in a little bit, uh, or should I go into that, uh, Sherry? Let's let's touch on it now. You can go ahead. Okay. Yeah. He was okay. Um, the group got together and came up with four things that they thought was uh, uh, the cause of death. And the first was apoplexy. Apoplexy was a term used very frequently in the nineteen twenties. And it generally referred to a sudden death of cerebral cause, like a stroke, although it could be due to cardiac. But what it was used in general was that it was a sudden death. 40% of people in Massachusetts in the 1920s died of apoplexy. So it was a little bit of a garbage diagnosis garbage can diagnosis, pardon me, um, where they felt that uh, maybe he had a blood vessel in his, in his head next to his breathing center that popped and that caused him to start to, to stop breathing and die. They didn't really have any clear idea about cardiac electrical function and uh, didn't really consider that at the time as you wouldn't expect anybody to. There were just a few people who were beginning to, to see that type of thing going on. There were EKGs, but they were EKGs of, of three leads. It was kind of like an eye, eye watch EKG. It wouldn't, wouldn't have helped with diagnosis, except that it was an irregular heartbeat, they would have known. So they said that was going on. They also felt that he had some kind of cholecystitis, that is a gallbladder infection uh, that um, uh, had come on mainly since uh, uh, um, leaping 
Alaska and had been present uh, pretty much, but those were the two that they uh, felt, there were four things, but they were, those were the two that they felt was uh, most important. And I'll stop there. Well, you can imagine the shock of not only his, his doctors, but the nurses, but all of the presidential party who had been told all day that things were looking up. Uh, the newspaper reporters who had been traveling on the train with them also were breathing a sigh of relief. And now everything has just turned upside down. So at this point, John's gonna tell us what happens um, with everybody kind of confused and feeling at odds about what's what's happening. So this has been a pretty cheery story so far. <clears throat> um, might as well keep going cheery. Uh, I mean, this this is really it, it's a huge contrast, and to really, I want you guys to really try to grasp just the confusion that up until a few days ago, this was a celebration. This was the event of your life that, that for these country people to see the president, experience the president. Just a day ago, I saw him talking. Just a day ago, I saw him swinging a golf club. What's, what's going on? This is shocking to the world. But we have to deal with it. So upon the presidential passing, uh, the president's body was placed in the care of the M. Gray and Company funerary parlor. And they took the care of the body for a few hours to get it prepared for uh, viewing and burial. The Gray Company provided the casket. There's always been this folklore that this was the same casket that was on the Henderson for Florence. It was not. Uh, when you're the president, you get your own casket. You don't share. Um, <laughs> Warren is going to be placed in a morning coat with striped trousers and ready for viewing. The casket will be returned to the Palace Hotel the next day, and a limited amount of mourners came to pay their respects to the president lying in the drawing room attached to the presidential suite of the, of the <laughs> Palace Hotel. Florence is said to be frequenting the room accompanied by Warren's sister, Charity, as well as Florence will be accompanied by Dr. Wilbur looking out the hotel room windows, noticing the throngs of people out front in uh, a melancholy sorrow, thinking of just, again, the shock for these people to be going through this with them. And Dr. Wilbur notes that while kind of embracing the first lady and supporting her by her arm, you could feel her pulse rising heavily with some still some concerns about her own health and how she's gonna be handling this. There was this hope by the local officials that there could be a large farewell procession in ceremony in San Francisco, but the decision was made that the party would head back east instead, and they'll leave the Palace Hotel and board the train to head back east, uh, accompanied from San Francisco with an honorary air flight guard flying over from the, air, uh, the, I guess the Army Air Force at that point. Um, as a shut a sign of respect to the fallen hero, um, which leads us on our fun calendar of heading back east. So the train, the celebration train for the voyage of understanding will now become a funerary train. Same train, same car. Again, shocking to people to sit there who just waved at this train days ago, weeks ago, seeing their president waving back. Now, instead, there's a flag-draped casket elevated and, and surrounded by flowers in the rail car of the Spur. Uh, there's an overhead light illuminating the casket, and the honor guard can be seen throughout the night. So as this train is going back east, all these throngs of people are coming to pay their respect, just as they came to wave and greet the president are now returning to say goodbye. And just the, the shock and the sights. There are so many people coming to the tracks. As they're approaching Chicago, they actually have to have a pilot train going ahead of them to clear the tracks of the people to get them off so the train can come through. And this, this is just huge. People don't know how to handle this. And one of the things that I was able to find amongst my research 
he asked for these and start that up for me. This is courtesy of the University of South Carolina. Uh, this is un, uh, unreleased footage of the funerary train coming through Chicago. I want you to take a look and just see, these are the crowds coming to see the train. So we had a gentleman with all telegrams of sympathy, of sympathy to be presented to the first lady and party. These are all the crowds waiting along the lines, the local Cub Scouts coming to present honors to the president. And you're gonna see these people dressed in their best, ready to go. You will see the flowers, being brought to be presented to the train as well. These people are waiting as long as it takes to, and mobbing these railroad yards, hoping to get a chance to say goodbye to the president. And this is happening all over. This is a good example for the metropolitan area. Of course, it's gonna be a larger crowded area, but this is everywhere heading back east. These same, the same railroad lines that took them west. So you'll see the, them trying to maintain a, some certain amount of order but everyone along with their ribbons, the Masons, the local politicians, trying to take their moment to pay respect to the fallen president. And there's no sound naturally, so this just feels even more authentic. But you have the Masons with their wreaths and their, of course, Warren being a Mason himself. They want to present to their brother and say goodbye along with veterans of the Civil War, Spanish-American War, and World War I, to the Commander-in-Chief of the United States. They had a nice little talk about something right there. They liked that one. <laughs> but all the children coming up as well. There's one guy out there that looks like he thinks he's all bad. There's his little tip of the cap. He thinks he's good. But like I said, this is the crowds coming. The, the reason I'm just trying to get to the last little bit here is you see the, the train come into the station and just to kind of see the crowds part and then kind of engulf the train one more time to follow it along. When you embed these things, it's very hard to get to go fast forward. But a wreath from the city of Chicago to be given to the funerary train as well. And that's the pilot train trying to clear the tracks. You can tell it's being very successful at the moment. And then you have the military guard ready to honor the president and present arms. You have all, both the Army and the Navy present there. And that's, that's where, like, I know this thing's a little bit monotonous, but just to be able to visually see, this is natural. This is not, this is just what's happening. So many thick on a, in a railroad yard. This is not an area that's meant for crowds to come by. Here comes the train, military leading to keep people off the tracks, and you've got one or two guys on the side kind of pushing people back. But the train's just crawling through Chicago at this point. Well, yeah, exactly. This is this train is not going to be arriving on time. I think you can tell that one, um, and it has to, and it should. I mean, I, the belief, especially with Florence, is to allow the people again their time with the president and say goodbye properly. And as we see the train pulling back out of the station, you're going to just start seeing the crowd following back with it again. This, uh, we still have the police trying to keep people back, but it's enveloped. People are following this thing along to say goodbye. So we are on a four day trip to return to the Capitol at this time. And the train will reach Washington at 1022 at night on August 7th. It's only nine hours behind schedule. Um, and you can tell why again. 
And then we start seeing moment, little ways of us mourning the president. Uh, it depends, I guess, on your perspective. I, I tried to, I've looked at this very differently. In honor of the fallen commander in chief and our executive, we have ribbons, black morning ribbons placed upon his desk in the Oval Office and his chair uh, saying goodbye to the man that once inhabited and doing work. And then Laddie Boy, the Airedale Terrier of the, the Hardings, you see him there looking out the glass doors of the White House, who was said to be extremely uneasy and unsettled just prior to Warren's passing. Laddie Boy becomes almost a symbol of the American people, something that people could relate to and understand. Uh, his pure love and loss was the same that was felt, that innocent feeling of the people. A poem was written by Edna Bell Seward and is set to music by George M. Seward called Laddie Boy, He's Gone. Um, not sure if anyone had ever really heard this or seen this, but it's a quick little poem just to kind of share the feeling, because again, this is meant to be Laddie Boy's the American people longing for the loss of their, their master, the one that they look to lead. Laddie boy, you lie there listening for a step that never comes. That noise ro rolling in the distance is the beat of the funeral drums. Tis for him the man you worship. Do not strain brown eyes of love. Laddie boy, your master's footsteps tread celestial paths above. He is gone, a nation's mourning. Many eyes are dim with pain. Not alone your dog heart's breaking for a glimpse of him again. Laddie boy, the price of living brings sore hearts like yours today, but your master is, is in his going points for us the better way. As you wait, brown Isaac listen for a master's face that's gone. He is smiling at you, laddie, from the peace of the beyond. But his name goes down immortal. Death's the price he had to pay, and he left a nation grieving, laddie boy, with you today. So meant to feel that anguish of that devotion, that love for someone that the nation really looked towards to rebuild following World War I, a softer, gentler man to help guide us in uncertain times to find our footing again is lost. And we're, uh, everyone is still trying to find their way. In the, white, uh, in the capital, a nation says goodbye to their leader, waiting in long lines to catch a glimpse of his casket in the capital rotunda. People are dropping to their knees outside of the White House to pray for the fallen and pray for the family and the country itself. Service is held in Washington, D.C. on August 8th at 11 o'clock a.m. The Calvary Baptist Church male quartet sings Lead Kindly in the Light. An invocation and benediction, benediction is read by Dr. A. Freeman Anderson of the Calvary Baptist Church. The whole procession, it's your, it's your standard funerary procession. Let's be honest, you read the couple psalms and passages and you speak of kind of uh, what comes next. But the, the choices of passages was more of a, a notion of who the man was and why he should be revered as such. Uh, the book of Psalm 23 was read, and in the, the passage it says, He has shown you, O mortal, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you, to act justly and love mercy and to walk humbly with your God reminding of everyone of his leadership, even in passing, of showing the right way and the right path to go. A man of great respect. Warren will lie in state until five o'clock when they must prepare for a trip back to Marion. The nation said goodbye to their president, the man who personified what they believed the president was supposed to be. And now he's set to return home to Marion. The funerary train arrives in Marion afternoon on August 9th, roughly one hour behind schedule again. So they did a little bit better coming from Washington, D.C. back than coming from the West. The casket is transferred out of Marion, uh, the, the Marion tra train station, onto the Cunningham Powered Hearse, which was loaned to local Schaffner Funerary Home, to, who took care of Funerary Parlor, who took care of the services. Uh, this specialized created hers was from Ravenna, Ohio, uh, complete with Masonic symbols all along the side as well. So it's a pretty, uh, I will say it's a pretty snazzy ride. If you're gonna go out, that's the way to go. Um, 
but we're now going to try to have our chance to say goodbye here in Marion. The possession, the procession takes the casket for a viewing at the home of Warren's father, Dr. G, George T. Harding Sr., uh, where he will be shown in the house's parlor. This funerary service will be held by the local Schaffner Funeral Home, and the public will say one more chant, uh, one more goodbye to their local hero, their favorite son from Marion. Four train cars worth of flowers will be delivered from the nation's capital. You'll see, and if you look in the photos, you see all these wreaths and flowers all over the front yard of the Harding home. Thousands of people come to see the president say goodbye. They are lined up for blocks for a chance to say goodbye one more time. We're going from, uh, I'm trying to think geographically how to explain it from here. You're about a block up and maybe a block over to the right. And it's going to go all, all the way to past where the star office into the heart of the town closer to the train station. People are lining up in the heat just to kind of go by. As the night goes on, it's getting later and later. And the thought is to close up the house for the night. And those people that came from all over to hopefully see the president would have to live with that disappointment. But Florence says, now nah, leave the doors open, let him come by. And they were staying and walking through late into the night to say goodbye to the president. Florence remains composed, almost stoic, and during all these processions, uh, she, it, it's the reverse. We talked about when Warren felt comfortable in the, the strength role when Florence was weak and ill. At this point, Florence took that role on with Warren's passing to be the strong and steady force for, the, for them now instead, uh, being accompanied by George Christian Jr. at her arm, their personal secretary, family friend. The final procession to the Marion Cemetery where Warren will finally be laid to rest will be on August 10th, 1923, and he will be placed into the Marion Cemetery holding vault at that time. Here, Warren Harding will lay under the watchful eyes of 26 of a 26-man honor guard. Uh, he'll be joined by wife Florence in November of the following year, and the Hardings will lie with frequent visitors to pay their respects. By May of 1926, approximately 1.2 million individuals would come to pay their respects in the Marion, uh, Marion Cemetery, and these are people from every U.S. state and many countries. And I know it sounds like, well, who the heck knows how many people came. Florence, before she passed, asked the honor guards commander to keep tally of how many people came by. That was part of their orders of the first lady. And they did keep a fairly accurate tally. I'm sure they missed at least one or two people out of the 1.2 million. But they tried to keep track of that as well. They will remain here in the holding vault until the completion of the Harding Memorial and being reinterred on December 20th, 1927. Four years, four months, and 10 days after Warren is laid to rest in the holding wall. And after a long and challenging process to create and complete the tomb, we all revere today, they are finally laid to rest. Now we know you probably have questions and we've assembled some questions that we get here at the presidential sites. Um, so we will, um, go through those. Number one was, and I think we kind of covered this with, with Richard, why did Dr. Sawyer announce in Seattle that President Harding's, <clears throat> excuse me, illness stemmed from food poisoning? Do you have any, anything to add from what you said before, Richard? No. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> We've already talked about this one. Why couldn't the doctor save the president? <clears throat> I think we've been through that. They just, they couldn't. They didn't have the tools. They didn't have the, um, the knowledge to address his problems. We, <clears throat> we've addressed this as well about apoplexy instead of heart attack or something else. So we won't go through that. Ah, let's do this one. Why was there no autopsy, Richard? <laughs> Well, that's, that's interesting because um, presidents rarely had an autopsy. The only two that really had an autopsy was Lincoln and Garfield. Lincoln had one right there at the home where he died, and Garfield had an autopsy 
because they couldn't find the bullet that killed him. And uh, they were frustrated and didn't know what to do, so they had an autopsy to find the bullet. It was in his chest. But um, after that, McKinley, Harding, FDR, and John F. Kennedy had an autopsy, but it was kind of an unusual one. We, never, we don't have any results from it and so forth. So it wasn't the usual thing for a president to have an autopsy. And um, Mrs. Harding didn't want one. She said he suffered enough um, and uh, didn't, didn't want to have that uh, done. I know that in the decades since the president's death, that's her decision to not have an autopsy has been looked on with suspicion. Um, at the time, there was no suspicion about it because he had died of natural causes. Is that correct? Correct. There, there was no, I mean, the, the doctors were all examining him over a, a week's period, five very competent doctors, and uh, there were no um, questions about uh, foul play, poisoning, or anything else that uh, would have um, caused a, a, a inquiry uh, to determine what uh, what had happened. This one is perfect for John. What about the story that Mrs. Harding poisoned her husband? Where did that come from? Um, John has done a lot of research into the man who started this story in 1930, so he's appropriately can address it. I like the slimy guys in these stories. Um, they're more colorful and exciting, and I, I have a bizarre soft spot in my heart for Harry Doherty, no matter how rough of a guy he can be sometimes. Gaston Means is the gentleman who started this whole rumor. If For those of you who may not have heard of the dastardly rogue Gaston Means, um, was a con man from North Carolina who worked his way through various cons for his entire life. Um, he, for example, we'll go through some of the fun ones with him. He somehow created a, a persona of being qualified to manage a wealthy widow's bankroll, which he paid himself and taught her how to play poker incorrectly and gambled with each other with her money, which was pretty cool. Um, he actually, uh, he was acquitted of it, although I'm pretty sure he did it, murdered her as well. He took her for a, a walk out into the, the forest to learn how to shoot a gun. And according to his testimony, he put the gun in the crux of a tree and warned her, whatever you do, do not touch this gun. I need to go over to this river and wash my hands. And he said, while I was bending over washing my hands, I heard a noise, turned around, and watched her shoot herself in the head with the gun. And he was acquitted of this. Uh, mostly because the big city lawyers from New York and North Carolina where this took place, the country folk didn't trust the big city lawyers. So obviously my local brethren of Gaston Means, there's, there's no way. He also found ways to swindle uh, during Prohibition. He, he ended up getting himself some work with, at that time, the Bureau of Investigation, the precursor of the FBI, and was selling illegal liquor permits to people saying that, you know, this this will work great. And he was just raking in the cash from that. He was briefly a spy for the German government during World War I. He found a way to promise a glass casket company who was under a criminal, a federal investigation for false claims and uh, defrauding investors. He told him, if you give me money, I can make sure that goes away. So he just defrauded them and walked away with them. During the Lindbergh baby case, he convinced Evelyn Walsh McLean of the Hope Diamond fame in the newspaper family through marriage that if he she gave him money, he could give the money to the kidnappers and get the baby back. And he just he dropped off the money, but the baby never came back. No one knows what happened to it. And and then once he was arrested, he started claiming that he kidnapped the baby. Uh, he was all over the darn place. So. You get the feeling this guy is just 
amazing what the stories that he can put together. He said during one of his trials that I have been accused of every crime in the catalog, but not convicted so far. I have never been convicted, but have been charged with every crime. While in prison, a visiting part-time writer and a wife of a preacher met him. Her name was Mae Dixon Thatcher. She became enthralled with talking to him, and he was telling her this story about when his time as a Bureau of Investigation, he was, you know, since he was an amazing investigator, obviously, he had intimate firsthand knowledge and experiences with the Hardings, that Florence trusted him as a confidant towards all these undue issues that were going on with Warren, and he describes her as almost an erratic emotional mess during different times. And, at the, and May Dix and Thatcher is just soaking this all up and writes this all down and publishes it as a book. And the, the big twist at the end, Florence tells him that I poisoned my husband and killed him in San Francisco out of just anger and revenge. And May Dix and Thatcher, oh my God, this is amazing, writes it down, publishes. And at this time in 1930, after all the other issues that the Harding name had gone through following his presidency, a public that was not real sure what to think of it anymore, and an image that wasn't as pristine at one time, ate it up. They thought this is this is amazing. This has got to be true because why wouldn't it be? Eventually, Mae Dixon Thatcher finds out that it's all a lie. She tries to come out and tell everyone, "No, nah, I got duped, guys. This isn't true." But it's too late. Pandora's box is open, and this story is out there. Interestingly enough, I got to talk to. Um, Gaston Means' granddaughter, um, Julie Kane's Mean, Julie Means Kane, I'm sorry, who operates an antique shop in upstate New York, in case you're curious. Um, she self published a book fairly recently off of her research claiming stories dealing with Gaston Means' wife being the, the brains of the operation or kind of leading it. The reason I bring it up is her story from her grandmother was almost like a gloating story that she talked about how her and Gaston would come together and think of whatever stories they could to see if Mae Dixon Thatcher would believe it. If we just make one a little bit more extreme, would she still believe us? And almost mockingly went along for the ride with it. So a story from one of the greatest con men out there is what started this belief that Florence must have poisoned. It was in a book. It's got to be true. It's in a book. Now, one of the complications to finding the truth is the Harding Presidential Papers were not available for research. And that was due to the Harding Memorial Association here in Marion, which had the papers. Uh, Dr. Carl Sawyer, son of Dr. Charles Sawyer, who was on the trip with the Hardings, um, he was president of the Harding Memorial Association and he would not let anybody research the papers. Um, so anyone who wanted to see if there was any truth to the poisoning story or look for a more balanced view of the Hardings couldn't find it. So he was trying to, I'm guessing, protect somebody during all this we don't really know what the motive was he didn't know it was in the papers either he never looked in the papers but he was protecting people from the papers he never looked yeah. at there is no smoking gun in the papers um i can tell you that but i i don't know what the motive was but it did a lot of harm and so rumors like the poisoning theory stayed around much much longer than they should have because there just wasn't any Thing to take its place. Um, at this point, we would like to know if there's any questions from our audience. So if you do have a question, if you raise your hand. And, yes. John, do you know if the, the first survived? I heard you say it was from Ravenna. Mm -hmm. I'm from Kent, so Ravenna's like five miles off the road from where I live. I'm just curious. I want to rephrase the question here so everyone can hear. Uh, Question is about the hearse uh, from Ravenna that was used for Harding's funeral and Marion, does it survive? Technical term is, I don't know. Um, 
uh, honestly, we had tried to find that at one point. There were some newspaper stories about it coming back. Following the funeral, the company that made it wanted to give it to Schaffner and allow them to continue to use it. I think it was kind of a dual purpose of getting it out there that we made this hearse. Don't you want this? And kind of become an advertisement. Uh, Schaffner said no thanks because they didn't want that to become the focal point of their business. Um, I know it had gone back to Ravenna, but from where I had done research, and I'll admit the last time I tried to chase down this uh, hearse was 2013. So, and I know down the rabbit hole I had gone and research, reviewing my past notes, it kind of faded off into existence. I have a feeling, uh, my best guess, as times went on, something of that ornate fashion just kind of fell out that people weren't looking for that. Uh, and it wasn't a desire, so the need to make those wasn't there, the need to use them wasn't there, so it just kind of faded out of use. Um, where it went from there, I, I can't confirm. Any other questions? This is not really a question, but I'm actually writing a book on Gaston. He killed a woman in one of my choir members' home and on their property. And I write there, I think, murdered her on August 29th of 1917. And we're actually having an autopsy. They're, they're going to my choir who gave me money for Christmas. We're having a body soon. You're bringing up Bod King? Yeah. And, well, and can I come down for Christmas? <laughs> what? I want to come down for Christmas and see Mod King and eat turkey. Let's do this. <laughs> well, she's not buried where they say she's buried. For years, everything that says she's buried in Graceland Cemetery in Chicago. She isn't. She's buried in Morrison, Illinois. Her body laid in Graceland for like four years in the crematorium. I was like, oh my God, please tell me they didn't cremate her. And, uh, but anyway, we found her, and I actually took my grandchildren with me up there a few weeks ago to the grave in Morrison, Illinois, the cemetery there. Um, and, but my my grandchildren would go and stomp on gas and pray. And I said, don't do that. I don't care how bad he was. So she can't stop on gas and But anyway, uh, yeah. Born, ever since I heard about Gaston, I was in the home where he grew up. One of my choir members lived in a former church in Concord where Gaston was on. His father had been the mayor twice and was a North Carolina senator, so I'm sure that helped with stuff too. But yeah, that I was so that's why I'm here. Was so, and you just made my <laughs> <laughs> um, For those of you listening online, I have no idea how to summarize. <laughs> the bottom line is she's writing a book about gas and means she's not a fan. So, <laughs> any other questions? Yeah. Well, I heard there uh, during the uh, Alaska trip there was a plane that flew in with a coded message. Is that just a made up myth? Question is that he heard that when the presidential party was in Alaska, there's a plane that flew in with a coded message. For her. Well, they they did deliver his mail regularly on the Western trip. That you know, we had a lot of airplanes, a lot of pilots that had flown in World War One. So a lot of them were mail carriers. Some of them were crop dusters. So the president was always in touch with the White House. So. I don't know anything about any coded messages, but I can tell you mail was delivered routinely to the presidential either train or in Alaska or on the mainland. Anything else? Yes. I'm wondering about Warren and Florence. What was their height and weight? I mean, I'm sure it varied, but. I can tell you that in Warren's passport, it was 5'11 and a half and 195. Florence was 5'6". They didn't list weight for a woman, which I think is a tremendous <laughs> idea. <laughs> Anything else? Okay. Well, we appreciate Dr. Richard um, giving his time um, and knowledge to the program. John did a tremendous amount of research here um, to our staff here at the Harding Presidential Sites. Uh, great support as always to Brett Hall, who is our 
man at the switch uh, doing this hybrid program. This wasn't easy to figure out. Um, so it worked and we'll do it more in the future. And yeah, everybody listening in the virtual world, uh, Alaska, California, I know there's a lot of you out there. Thanks for joining us. And to our audience in here, thank you very much for coming out. We appreciate it.